Um, okay, well, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Natalino Busa, and uh, uh, today I have like uh, probably one of the the biggest mix I put in the cauldron of technology. So I hope it works. There will be like a bunch of different topics uh, that we're gonna uh, talk about. We're gonna talk about data science. We're gonna talk about uh, 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 this project called Jupyter and Jupyter Notebooks. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how to uh, to work with front-end and back-end development when you actually mix up data science, uh, computer science, and uh, and the app development. So let's jump straight into it. But before that, just uh, that's my handle. It's uh, pretty much everywhere. So you can use it, not Busa, to uh, connect with me. I've been working at ING, at Teradata, uh, O'Reilly, author, plus a couple of startups, uh, metanumerics, cognitive finance. They're all about AI and AI technologies for, uh, uh, for a bunch of sectors, uh, telecom, finance, and so forth. Um, so very quick. Um, you know, in, in, in the good old days, we had this thing called paper and pen. And what you could do, you could write formulas, and some people didn't even need the calculator. They would just, uh, you know, like just make the, uh, they could actually write down numbers and multiply them on paper. Can you imagine? I mean, it's, it's crazy. So, of course, nowadays, you, we don't do that anymore. It's uh, completely useless, this, uh, this process. But, uh, but the process itself is still very interesting. I mean, um, if you want to understand something about the world, you're going to uh, observe what you see around, uh, you're going to make some hypotheses, um, and then you would conduct some experiment. And after that, you might actually build an app or maybe build a report. And uh, today, the good thing is that we still do the same thing, but none of these steps is actually uh, can be done without the help of, uh, of some equipment, some, some tools. So in fact, computers, uh, they are uh, absolutely uh, ubiquitous in this process. They, they, from the beginning till the end, you will have to, do, to deal with machines, uh, unless you want to do all the, the math on, the, on paper, which is still a good exercise for, for the brain. Um, but OK, so, uh, so we are going to talk about the scientific method. And that guy is the, the guy that invented the name scientist. So it was 200 years ago. Uh, that's when a scientist uh, was made a profession. So now we have data scientists. And, uh, uh, and today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you something about the so-called data science experience. So the data science experience is, or a data scientist experience is what happens when someone that has done a little bit of math, or maybe a lot, uh, uh, and uh, uh, let's say statistics, machine learning, computer science, gets in front of uh, a terminal, of a, of a, of a computer, um, how does it interact with the, with the data? What sort of, what is this process? Of course, we know a lot about, for instance, you might be aware of the uh, programmer experience, or the user experience. So what happens when you open, for instance, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, PyCharm or, uh, or your favorite I, I, um, IDE, like uh, Eclipse or, uh, or uh, IntelliJ? You have an idea about the experience. You open that, you get all these windows popping up, and then you start coding things, and then the errors pop up, etc. So. How does it look for a data scientist? And can we actually make sure that the data scientist is still linked to a development process? So uh, data scientist is a very particular person that is using uh, three technologies, uh, uh, or, or three, let's say, components. Uh, tools, well, that's common to everybody. Is using math. Uh, as an also as a sort of a component as in his recipe, so machine learning, uh, uh, deep learning. Now there is all this big hype about AI, and uh, most often the not is also using uh, the cloud or some form of distributed computing, whether it is in premise or uh, or on the cloud. So things like uh, uh, Spark or uh, or uh, distributed databases like Cassandra and so forth. They'll come in the picture. 
So um, one thing that uh, is um, you have to understand about the data scientist experience is that it needs to uh, grok data. It needs to understand the meaning of data. So it's not just uh, that the program compiles, but it needs to see why that particular group of people, for instance, is a good candidate for an ad or for a campaign, and that other group of people is not. Um, now, the difference is that in a normal, uh, let's say, um, um, programming environment, if something doesn't work, you get an error. But um, let's say a data science environment will not give you an error, will give you actually another number. So how do you deal with that? So one thing to do uh, and to work with is a project called Jupyter. So uh, Jupyter is, a, is an environment where actually um, you are able to uh, program on the browser um, and, and actually write a number of languages. Uh, the most common of those would be uh, basically R, Python, and, uh, and Scala. And actually uh, define in that environment your own, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, data science. Okay, So it's a web application. If you look at it from a, from a designer perspective, it's a web application uh, to create and share documents and to do a lot of data science steps like data cleaning, uh, statistical modeling, uh, machine learning. So um, I would like to very quickly to, uh, to start uh, uh, some, uh, a Jupyter uh, uh, window just to, to see if something works, just to give you a bit of a feeling about it. So, for instance, I can, I'm going to start a mini, uh, let's say, network with, uh, let's make it really big, uh, with the Docker Compose. Okay, let me, let me start from the top. Um, so this Docker Composite uh, I'm starting now is basically a network with two nodes. Uh, one is a Jupyter notebook. It's going to run on one uh, container. And, uh, uh, and the other container uh, is, uh, uh, on, uh, um, is running actually Cassandra. First, we need to kill a few things, as usually is uh, kill, kill, kill. OK. So if I start this one, I'm going to start two containers. One container is going to uh, be used for, for our data. So I can it still keeps bugging me. OK, take three. Ha. So uh, all, all this stuff that you see on the screen, that's all Cassandra. It's a bit chatty if you don't put the, 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 the right setting. And uh, the other thing that you see here is actually our, our notebook. So our notebook uh, uh, is a web application. So it will run on the web. So let me actually get out of this and run it on the web. And uh, the first thing that you will notice is that uh, uh, it starts like a sort of a repository for, uh, for documents. And then it's, um, it's a thing that allows you to uh, combine text in a, a markdown format uh, with, with actual code. Uh, so how many of you have actually used the uh, notebooks uh, so far? So it's a good. Uh, 50%. So ju just, just very quickly, so you can double click on the markdown cell. You can, you can see that from, uh, from the type of the cell here above and say, uh, OK, I am going to run some amazing, amazing um, data science. OK. Well, this is how you're going to basically uh, um, document your script, and then you can run your uh, your code. So, for instance, you can start uh, uh, reading from files, uh, reading from the web. 
So in principle, for those of you who have used notebooks, they know that uh, um, if you can do it in Python, it, you can do it on a notebook. So uh, do you want to connect to the web, fetch data from the web? You can do that. You want to connect to a database? You can do that. So if I'm starting, uh, let's say, uh, adding things here, and for instance, just to see um, a little bit of data science, I can take the data from uh, uh, comma-separated uh, uh, files and transform it into a data frame, and then I can start doing things like, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, sorting, the, sorting my events and providing with some sort of understanding about how the data is working. In the meantime, I can write a lot of documentation, and that's great, right? So so far so good. You can proceed on, and you can uh, and you can do uh, very nice things. For instance, uh, uh, I'm going a little bit fast here, so you can add uh, uh, visualization like this one, where actually you take the data from either the Cassandra database or from your uh, your uh, comma-separated value file. And uh, you can, for instance, plot dots and uh, uh, about events in the city, in this case in, in uh, New York, for, uh, uh, for uh, check-ins. And there is your data science experience right there. So um, it feels great. However, at a certain point, you have to talk with the data, uh, uh, with engineers. So that is a, a, a tricky moment because um, they're going to ask you or you're going to ask them, OK, where, where is your script? They say, I don't have a script. I, I, I wrote a notebook. Say, what's that? So, so the question now becomes, uh, how do you make sure that this thing and your uh, backend processing and your development cycle in the back, uh, in, in, in the backend can be combined? So one way to do so is, uh, for instance, copying the, the information and translate it into a, a Python script. But why doing that if you, we actually have already written our Python, right? And this is what I'm going to discuss with you in more details. Um, so how much time do we have? Are we at the half of it? 20 minutes? OK, good. So. Uh, so we have our notebook, and the notebook is great. We can share. We can pick up a language, like R, Python, Scala. Um, we have a number of interactive, uh, inter interactive widgets. So we've just seen, for instance, uh, a table, and we have seen uh, a picture. And we can integrate with big, let's say, uh, uh, um, environments of distributed computing. So while uh, um, let's say your uh, interface uh, is this uh, nice uh, web application. At the behind that, there can be a cluster of tens of of hundreds of nodes doing actually the analytics. So it's really a window uh, to interact with data uh, in in, uh, in in any way. Yeah. And uh, uh, let me put it back on uh, present mode. So we've seen a number of, uh, uh, let's say, elements of this uh, interface. Uh, so we, we can actually start and stop the kernel. So the web app and, uh, and the actual thing that runs, the, in this case, Python script, are two separate components. So I can have the interface, and I can say, OK, I want to restart the kernel. It will re uh, forget all these, uh, uh, let's say, variables, and it will start from scratch. Uh, we have the concept of cells, so we have markdown cells, and we have code cells. Uh, we have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, widgets and, uh, and uh, uh, output, which could be either, uh, uh, let's say, actual text, like you see here, or it could be like HTML-ified sort of output, like uh, graphs or tables. So. Um, uh, I want to give you in this uh, uh, remaining 15 minutes a bit of a, uh, let's say, uh, understanding how this Jupyter project works from the inside out. So uh, Jupyter is basically made out of uh, uh, three big components. So you have actually the, the web app, 
that you see that uh, thing with the with cells that I just showed you, uh, you would also have the the server part uh, 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 the server counterpart of that, uh, which is uh, going to be the notebook, which is responsible for uh, um, uh, reading in the notebooks and passing the notebook uh, uh, to the to the app for visualization. And the most important component uh, uh, of all is the kernel, is the one that actually executes the code. And uh, in between the, the client and, and, and the kernel, there is the server, which is doing a pretty smart job. It's basically taking uh, those messages. So when you push the button and you press, uh, let's say, Control Enter or uh, Shift Enter on your, uh, on your browser, sends that snippet of code via a WebSocket, send it to the server, and the server translate the, the, the message into a 0MQ message, send it to the, to the kernel, and the kernel uh, wrapper execute that snippet um, and, and returns the, re the result all the way back to the browser. So, this is great, and it works fantastic if you have notebooks. But you see that this sort of architecture is also extremely, uh, uh, let's say, suited to separate uh, the server from the, from the client. So, you, so what you in fact can do is, if you're like the notebook as a web app, you can continue using it. But if you, you want to build a different app, which is not a notebook, in fact, you can do it, because the only thing that this thing is doing is actually passing the data back and forth uh, uh, to a server and then to, a, uh, to the kernel and back. So it's a modular architecture to recap with three parts, web app, server, and kernel. The kernels are uh, extremely, uh, let's say, there is an extremely wide range of kernels, Python, R, Scala, but also more, uh, let's say, exotic languages like uh, uh, Julia, uh, Spark QL for, uh, uh, for a relational, uh, 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 let's say, entity uh, sort of uh, data. Um, uh, you have Bash, so in fact you can, uh, you can write, uh, uh, let's say, Linux scripts from the web, which is, I think it's a cool thing. I don't know if, uh, let's say, a Linux uh, uh, administrator would really enjoy that, but you can do that too. Uh, and you have this very nice and reactive uh, uh, web app, which is asynchronous, allows rich editing, highlighting, and, uh, and a lot of other features. So what I want to share here is that, OK, now you all know what the Jupyter Notebook is. What I want to focus now is on the uh, data scientist experience. A, a good data scientist is a good storyteller. So it's a person that actually wants to share some sort of form of a story, a narrative about the data. Like, hey, you see, I've seen all these people checking in, in, uh, in New York. And uh, look, some of them are in uh, Madison Square. Uh, others are in, the, uh, uh, let's say, in other locations of the city, Central Park, and so forth. What about, and then it comes with a story that hints in the direction of maybe a business idea or some uh, way of uh, optimizing, uh, let's say, the, the user, uh, uh, let's say, uh, park in a number of categories and clusters, etc. So it re it's really about understanding the data and from the data driving a sort of, exp uh, let's say, uh, business out of it. Um, so, in fact, uh, this is the, the, the metric slide. Uh, is So what if I told you that, but I already told you, so it's not a surprise now. But what if I told you that the notebook is not just the notebook, but is any, anything that you can build with JavaScript. So um, how many of you here in the room are, are front-end developers or, uh, or, en or enjoy front-end, uh, let's say, application? Yeah, I mean, who doesn't enjoy Facebook? It's a front-end application, huh? That's OK, anyways. So, <laughs> so um, you can do a lot of things, because once you think of the power of, uh, let's say, something like, uh, 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 let's say, React 
or uh, uh, let's say Angular or uh, 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 Vue combined with the possibility of tapping directly into a notebook which has been written by a data scientist which is actually performing machine learning and AI operations straight directly from your JavaScript application. And I have a few examples for that. One is live, I can show you. It's uh, been implemented at O'Reilly, it's not mine. It's uh, an O'Reilly Oreo, it's called. And uh, uh, this thing goes as follows. What they've done is, uh, that's me again on, uh, on O'Reilly. What they've done is they have actually taken a notebook, but now this notebook does not, you don't see the server at all. The server is gone. It's actually somewhere in the cloud of O'Reilly, and what you see is a little bit of uh, the code that you've seen on the local, uh, uh, let's say, notebook, but now you don't need to install anything. So the only thing you need to do, and this is running live from O'Reilly, it will start a Docker container in the O'Reilly cloud, and you actually have here, right here, you have your uh, running code executing Cassandra, Python, Spark, um, whatever you need, scikit-learn, all these great libraries, straight from the browser. And you don't even have any more the reason to actually start the server. And I want to pick at least one cell where, which produces a little bit of output, just to let you know that, in fact, this is actually working. You see? The output is coming up. So actually, you have, a co you have computing power on the browser with a serverless scenario. Now imagine how many applications of this time we can actually of this type we can actually build with with a with a couple of good uh, let's say front-end developers in combination with data scientists. So data scientists and front-end and back developers, they're now united to build basically smart application. I, and this is, in a nutshell, if you forget everything else, that's the only thing that I would like you to remember. I mean, front-end, back-end, and data science, they're now, let's say, this sort of uh, this holy trinity for the next generation of apps. And uh, the guys at O'Reilly, of course, they have crafted the application in a particular direction because they wanted uh, the video to be synchronized with the, uh, with, with the presentation and so forth, etc. And uh, if you scroll down, uh, you can resume the, the video whenever, uh, uh, whenever uh, you go, and etc., etc. Um, Okay, enough about, uh, uh, about O'Reilly Orioles. Um, back to our presentation. I just want to give you a bit of a, let's say, that secret sauce, how this actually might work if you want to implement it in your, uh, in your future projects. Uh, the way it works is actually pretty, pretty simple. Um, the only thing that you need to do is to kind of uh, uh, do a bit of this surgeon on that sort of architecture. So chop the head off, take that, uh, let's say, the web app uh, of uh, uh, the notebook out of the picture and replace it with whatever you like. So the rest uh, stays kind of the same. So for O'Reilly Orioles, you would have an Oriole web app uh, instead of the uh, notebook web app. But the rest is pretty much the same. And what you can also do, uh, this is, we've just seen this one, or you can just build your own narrative. So an example that they've built in the past uh, is, in fact, uh, a sort of a, um, let's say, a science project for actually people who cannot write code for data science, but they would like to play with the data and maybe uh, 
let's say, kind of uh, see the, the effects of uh, a particular sort of clustering or a particular form of, uh, let's say, data uh, preparation and so forth. So you, you can build, uh, 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 let's say, a prototype like this. I'm, I'm sure that you will, you will do a much cooler job with the, with the graphics than uh, what I'm presenting here. Uh, but the, the, the idea behind it is not so much uh, that uh, uh, you, can, you can do this sort of UI, but that the UI actually is fetching the, this information. So for instance, uh, um, um, loading a data set, understanding how many features are in this data set. This is the very famous uh, uh, iris data set with all the flowers with different, uh, let's say, petal and uh, sepal, uh, uh, let's say, dimensions. So the one with the small flowers, bigger flowers. So there are three, three classes of irises. Um, for those of you uh, who don't know what uh, an iris uh, flower is, I'm going to show you so that you have an idea. This, uh, these are uh, iris flowers. So there are three categories. And this, this data set is able to uh, separate those uh, categories. So um, once that you have done it, um, what you can do with it is uh, pretty much uh, you can understand, okay, if there are three classes, and for instance, one class uh, is super popular and sells like at twice the price of the other classes, uh, can I build a small robot that looks at the flower measure uh, with his uh, robotic eyes, is the length of his petals, and, uh, and picks all the good ones that are uh, twice the, uh, the, the, the uh, let's say, the value of the others. Well, and this is the data science that you do behind, you start doing... Uh, uh, let's say, a, a bit of a histograms on those categories. And eventually, you could send uh, this, uh, um, this message back to the server, which is executing more data science. And all of a sudden, it comes out with uh, uh, a picture saying, look, in this data set that you've given me, I see three clusters. Some flowers are really weird. Those are the one in red. And the other one are pretty much separated. You can see that the clusters, uh, they are located here. So the secret sauce, how does it work? It's quite simple. On the notebook side, the data scientist, what he does, he actually declares uh, a couple of those cells uh, to be endpoints. So, and there is a sort of a, 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 sort of a, a mechanism it's, uh, uh, it's, it's written there, you write hash, which is in Python is like uh, a command, and then you write the, uh, your uh, uh, um, uh, HTTP method, in this case get or post or uh, delete, etc. And you write the endpoint uh, where, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, colon followed by a name, would, where they would be actually identifier, uh, identifiers that you can actually use in your Python code. So then, uh, that cell, every time that it res uh, responds uh, from, the, from the Jupyter server, it will actually send that message, not vi uh, via, uh, let's say, the, the browser, because we don't have the app anymore, but will send a message actually as an uh, HTTP response. And here is one way of doing it. So you could, for instance, say, I would like the response as a dictionary, and I would like the response to be encoded as uh, application JSON. Uh, and once you do that, then uh, you actually generate JSON out of a notebook. OK? So this one is, in fact, is already an embedded app. You could tell me, yeah, maybe there are better ways to do so. There are. Of course, we, are, uh, we, we sit here, we know a lot about uh, web uh, application. There are a zillion ways of generating, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, backend uh, REST uh, APIs. Uh, but the good thing of this is that it's really l low threshold for the data scientist. So the data scientist is, stays close to, the, to his domain of doing data science, and the same notebook is 10 minutes later, available for the app. So think about the Facebook dream team, like the mathematician and the, and the crazy guy that li likes to do, a, uh, let's say, uh, to, uh, to categorize, uh, 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 let's say, girls in campus. 
uh, uh, you've seen the movie, right? So imagine that thing, now it's combined with, with just a few lines of code by having a notebook where the mathematician is, is writing his uh, algorithm for, uh, uh, for let's say, uh, scoring, and, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the app guy is actually providing the, the, the service and, and the application. Uh, this one is the other part. So if you are actually the, the engineer, the, the front end, the back end uh, uh, guy, so how does it look? This is for those of you who are uh, familiar with, the, uh, uh, with front end development, uh, uh, you would recognize uh, Angular 1 code here. And you see, in fact, uh, exactly the counterpart of that uh, other slide where I actually go in this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, um, endpoint, uh, cog uh, datasets uh, slash ID, I'm actually fetching the data, and now the data is on the browser. So it's really like uh, back and forth, <laughs> browser, notebook, notebook, browser. And of course, uh, you, can, you can make it as beautiful and as nice as you like. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 then the data becomes this. So you actually have an app at the end of it. A few more things. So uh, if you want to use Jupyter and you don't want to, uh, to install too many things, there are already Docker containers uh, prepared with already Jupyter in it and a number of libraries that you can uh, immediately start. Some of them, they actually even run Spark. Um, if you want to run the gateway, so this mechanism to translate cells into endpoints, you just need these six lines of code, so that the secret sauce to have it running. And uh, that's how you start it up. Um, yeah. You, you, you left the slide, you don't need to read it now. But it's basically Docker starts Jupyter that starts the kernel gateway that starts the notebook. Simple. Uh, OK, so you can connect it to a, a big processing environment if needed, or you can run it on a single node. So summary to finish, Jupyter is great. I guess that that was clear. So uh, if you like Jupyter and you want to get more out of Jupyter, Jupyter is not just the notebook, but it's also this ecosystem of tools and, uh, and components to create, uh, uh, let's say, really compelling application, whether they are just for uh, uh, prototyping or demonstrator or, uh, or uh, storytelling or they're real apps. It's up to you to, uh, to decide. And we've seen uh, 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 two apps, which are three apps. One is the notebook itself, or O'Reilly Orioles. And uh, uh, one we've seen it on the slides, which is this sort of auto science example. There's a number of resources for you if you want to dig in this sort of technology. And uh, uh, this is everything for today. So I hope you enjoyed that. I have two questions. Thank you for your talk. Uh, first question is, so as I get it, the data scientist works with in, a, in a notebook, but then, do you hear me? It's better. Uh, I can it's better, hear okay. yeah. So the data scientist works uh, in a data book, and then as an application developer, I come to this uh, gateway yeah. and consume the, the data sets, I guess. Is it, how do I discover the API uh, endpoints and stuff like that? So uh, the API are uh, these things with the hashes, Mm -hmm. um, that thing uh, is actually pre-read uh, by the, uh, this app. So there are, uh, I think I went a bit too fast there. Um, so look at this. Jupyter is the server, OK? The server is not running the notebook. It's running a different app, a, a server app, which is called the kernel gateway. The kernel gateway takes your notebook. Yeah scans for the cells, any time that he finds a cell with hash get bloody blah, blah yeah. it actually exposes that endpoint automatically. Okay, so you put so the, the endpoint URL in the notebook itself. Yes. 
And uh, the only thing that you need to do is uh, to use uh, some sort of reverse proxy to kind of create a nice sub, uh, let's say, subdomain or subdirectory for your endpoint. So for instance, uh, uh, this one will go on, uh, let's say, slash, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, clustering. And that would be the, the let's say, the, the root endpoint for, uh, or the, let's say, the root path for that endpoint. But then you put it some wherever you want. So with the reverse proxy, you can put it uh, under uh, AI slash ML or uh, ML uh, uh, minus API, uh, whatever you like. But in principle, so the data sets are exposed because of a hashtag it, in the It doesn't notebook. expose the data set. You decide which computing elements of those cells are coming out as JSON. Okay. Or, or whatever you like. You can, you can push files, XML. I mean, it's very, in fact, it's just a, an interface to exchange uh, data out. OK. And then my second question is, so when I see these notebooks, is that cool? But as a, a software developer, I immediately want to put this code in a version control system. Yeah, is you can do that. Is there a way to do that? Yeah, well, oh, oh, well of course. Because you type your code in the browser, right? Yes, Does but, end up uh, oh, OK. So let's go to uh, GitHub. So if you go to, to, to my GitHub account, just as an example, and I take, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this is one application that I wrote in, in a notebook about uh, uh, predicting defaulting on credit cards. It's a more financial one. Um, so there you have your notebook um, as uh, a couple of formats. This is the rendered format. Yeah, okay. and of course it's uh, uh, it's version controlled, uh, but you could also uh, um, look at the source code. It's not yeah the source code of a notebook is JSON, so the actual internal representation is a JSON file. Okay. I don't know if I can show you that uh, uh, representation. Yeah, other question. Just a quick question. Um, Jupyter, it's only Python, or does it also support multiple languages in different? Uh, ah, thank you. Uh, just, just a quick question. Uh, Jupyter is uh, only Python. I've seen other, other sort of like mathematical books, uh, yes. we web, web interfaces, uh, yes. web apps that support several languages. Does uh, Jupyter also support other languages in different cells, or is it only Python? So uh, if the question is, can you mix cells? Yes. Yeah. But then you need to create a kernel that uh -huh. is able to interpret multiple languages. OK. So there is a sort of a, uh, let me show it. If you're working uh, with uh, some languages, there is a sort of a, uh, let's say, I'm giving you a a live demo. Uh -huh. So for instance, if I write, um, if, uh, if I write actually a question, uh, uh, exclamation mark, I can use, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Linux commands. OK. Uh -huh. However, if I write, for instance, uh, 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 Scala code, uh -huh. yeah, and if I write here uh -huh. uh, A is uh, 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 1, then it will say, yeah, invalid syntax. Why? Because this kernel is interpreting only one language. However, uh, the number of languages that are there are it's quite extensive. I think the list is about 20 plus. Yeah. And there are a few kernels which are multi-language. Awesome. So there are kernels where actually you can write something like uh, uh, um, percent percent, uh, uh, let's say, Python. And then you start writing in Python. Uh, that's not Python. Eh? Uh, so like uh, A is uh, one, two, three, yeah? And you can write another cell uh, where actually uh, you have Scala, and the kernel allows you to share variables from the different uh, ah, environment. Personally, I don't know how much of that you would like to use because uh, it's, uh, I find it a little bit cumbersome because mm. you're, you're doing variable sharing across different, uh, 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 let's say, REPLs, which is yeah. kind of uh, uh, But it's probably useful to, to, do, um, to include 
include notebooks written in other languages in your own? Yes, you, yes. Yeah. But personally, what I do is I use a database as the interface. Okay. So for instance, if a notebook is written in R, what I do is I make sure that either a database or a, or a file is the interface for the other notebook. So if the other notebook is in Python, then I just read the data set either from file or from, uh, from database. Yeah? Yeah, I also have a question. Um, what about the security um, about your web API? How do you secure it? Is it already in it, or do you have to build it yourself? So this stuff is for free. If you talk about what about security, then it means you would like to pay some money. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so normally it works like that. Um, either you have, uh, let's say, a great group of engineers, uh, and then you actually figure out your own security, or and or you can take the risk. Yeah, for auditing and uh, regulatory reason, it's fine if you want to take it. But suppose that uh, you work in a bank, or a telecom. Me? Yeah. No. I'm just I'm just a student. Just, just a student. OK. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely, I see a, a path paved uh, out for you. Uh, so in that case, uh, you could decide a, a number of things. Uh, notebooks uh, uh, these days are becoming themselves building blocks or bigger apps. Think about Sense.io. Try to remember this name. Or uh, IBM Ab Atlas or uh, uh, DataIQ. These are uh, sort of environment. Uh, which provide a notebook as a sort of an embedded component for uh, a distributed collaborative data science at scale, in production, and with the right security measures. So you would have all the, the Kerberos, the, uh, let's say, the, um, uh, your uh, PAM authentication or your uh, uh, authentication based uh, on uh, uh, active uh, directories. I mean, you, you name it. Normally, that part uh, uh, comes with uh, uh, some customization. Um, and if you want to use it this way, you can already use it. Security is indeed uh, a serious topic and must be tackled appropriately. OK, thank you. Yes. Hi, so is there any possible communication between uh, each notebook? I mean, uh, for example, one notebook using an output of another uh, notebook? Yes. So uh, which language do you pr code usually? Let's say Python. OK, so Python, they have a thing which is called uh, 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 Import. Uh, sockets. Ah, OK. So if you have sockets, you can talk with whoever and whatever you want. That's the actually probably the, the easiest answer. If there is a mechanism inside the notebook to talk between notebooks, uh, no, there is not. So each notebook is actually independent. But as I was telling you, uh, the code that you execute can be any code at all. So for instance, if I'm doing, I don't know, um, HTTP request, which is, a f uh, uh, let's say, a pretty common uh, library for Python. Uh, nobody prevents you to actually write uh, some socket interfaces. Uh, or for instance, I don't know if you're familiar with Tornado. You could actually make an embedded uh, thing and, uh, and make sure that those things talk with each other. You have also to keep in mind that a notebook is essentially is a sort of a REPL in a browser. So if you lock a cell by creating a sort of infinite loop looking for, uh, uh, let's say, um, waiting for some incoming socket connection, it will not proceed to the rest of the cells. So sh I'll show you the notebook again just to understand this thing. So what about the other cells? Yeah. So uh, notebook communicating with each other, yes. Uh, but keep in mind exactly what is the goal you want to solve and whether you are okay like executing the a sort of a uh, a sort of a uh, loop at the end of the notebook once that you have processed everything or if you prefer actually 
uh, let's say, queries that return and use a database for communication. There's also an option. So there are many ways. OK, thank you. Yeah, we need to wrap up now. All right, cool. Hey, thank you, guys, everybody. It was really cool being here. Thank you. <laughs>